glad to have an opportunity to speak to you and uh, take your Bible, if you would, and go to Nehemiah. And in the book of Nehemiah, uh, Nehemiah is a man sent back. He had a burden to minister, to go back and do something for his God. And, uh, you know, I, I don't read that he was highly educated. Uh, he was of the king's house, and he was, uh, he was of royal blood, so he might have had some kind of education. And uh, no doubt, though, he had caught the eye of, of the Lord, and uh, he finds himself in captivity because it was at a time that the nation of Israel was uh, in captivity. And he gets a burden for his homeland and his city, Jerusalem. And he knew it had been destroyed by the Babylonians, and he was the Babylonian king's cupbearer. He was made a cupbearer. And uh, he gets to go back. And you kind of know the story. He's quite a character in the Word of God. But there's a couple words, a phrase or two here that is spoken left for us in scripture and uh, my, my prayer is that it would help us tonight uh, somehow and I think it's always the prayer of the preacher teacher that whatever you get to say would help somehow someone along the way but in Nehemiah chapter 4 I just want the first two verses there and uh, I uh, uh, I was listening to uh, Brother Chad give the announcements this morning and uh, just kind of hit me. And uh, he, uh, he announced that Brother Skipper will be here. And I'm looking at our, I guess this is, this is today's. So Brother Phil Skipper is an evangelist. And uh, I've known Phil for a number of years. And uh, he's, he's been a friend to me, and uh, I've shared things with him. He's prayed for my family. I've prayed for his family. We've prayed for the ministry together. And uh, I just got a burden on my heart since this morning about our upcoming meeting. And uh, uh, I, I would like, uh, as a leader in the church, to encourage the church to begin to pray for this meeting. Uh, uh, we can keep coming and going, showing up, going home, doing our thing, coming back. But I, I firmly believe that the church needs a vision. And where there is no vision, the people perish. So uh, as I take my text tonight, uh, it's... It's with a heavy heart for the upcoming services. Not that we don't get preached to. We had a good message today, wonderful, solid message. Wednesday night, I tuned in, listened to it after the fact, but good deliveries. Jeremiah done a wonderful job. I'm sure the classes, they're teaching and they're going forward, but just every once in a while, we need to refurbish the sword. We need to refill the cup. We need to retool the die and uh, stay on that cutting edge for the glory of God. So Nehemiah was one of these kind of men who had a vision to go accomplish the unaccomplishable, to go do the undoable, to go put himself in harm's way when he could have stayed in the palace and in enjoyed his job with the king and just put all the things that were burdening his heart on the back burner and just say, well, you know, it ain't my fault. I'm going to let somebody else figure it out. But no, he, he didn't do that. And at the demise of his own life, it was a, it was a crime to come into the presence of the king with a sad countenance. They would kill you for that those pagans. 
But the king took note and he got an audience and he told the king his burden and his heart and the king probably thought in his heart, were you crazy? Man, you can't go back there. We destroyed that place. But you know what? He, he had a vision that was not human. He had a vision that was from God. He had a burden that wasn't uh, secular. He had a burden that was spiritual. And he, he wanted to go do, he just wanted to go try to do something for God. And could I say there's plenty to do yet, plenty to do. So in verse 1 in chapter 4, and I'll take this, and I just have some verses, and I've titled the, the message tonight, uh, Thoughts on Revival. Thoughts on Revival. And I want to get you thinking about the meeting that's coming up. It says, but uh, it, it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones? out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Could I answer every one of those questions? Yes, 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 yes. And that's why I said he went to do the undoable, but he's doing it. And they did, they did raise the stones up. They did build the wall. They did accomplish the burden that was laid upon his heart and they were revived. The nation of Israel was revived and so the word revive shows up and it means to bring, bring back to life, bring to newness of life something that was once there but has fallen by the wayside a little bit and, 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 and needs to be helped out. It needs to be built up. It, means, it needs to be fortified. Then David said this in Psalms 85 verse 6. Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Here's a man after God's own heart, but sees at a moment, at the blink of an eye, the great need the children of Israel had. And so he uses the word that the Holy Spirit records and leaves, Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Could I answer that question? Yes. Yes. He will revive us again. And then David, many psalms passed the 85th psalm by Psalms 138 verse 7. He says, though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Now, the first time it's mentioned we're raising up a city and doing a great work for the glory of God. We're ministering. The second time it's mentioned it's about a great nation of people that David was supposed to lead. But now he's talking about a personal relationship with his God. Because even the men and the people that are after God's own heart sometimes need reviving. Watch. He says... Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. That's a very positive statement. He knew something about his God. Not only had he revived the nation of Israel, but here he said, thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. There's no answer to that. That's a statement. There's no questioning that. Uh, that's a positive fact of faith. God will revive his own. With that thought, I guess we would ask the question, what do we hope to accomplish with a series of meetings? From a man we don't even know that well, Phil Skipper. Uh, 
Could I give you a few reasons tonight why I think our church needs revival? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for your word. Thank you for a chance to speak, preach your word, and help us, Lord, to uh, help others and help us, Lord, to see uh, great things from the scriptures that you, uh, Lord, want to show us. Uh, help now tonight. Uh, save that one that may be lost. Encourage that one that might be uh, in need of, of, of your word tonight. These things I ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. So what do we hope to accomplish with those series of meetings? Why do we set time aside to meet like this? Uh, there must be another way to reach our potential in Christ. There must be some other program that's available to us for us to snatch the vision that every church needs. Uh, there must be another way uh, simply to reach out for Christ. Uh, can any good come from such a revival meeting? And I'd like to answer that tonight and give you some reasons why I think Hope Baptist Church needs revival. Number one, I, I, we want to have faith to minister. Faith to minister through the preaching of the Word of God. And I find that Paul said this to, the Timothy, uh, to young Timothy in chapter 4 of the second Timothy, chapter 4 and verse 2. He simply said, it's a very simple verse of Scripture to the preachers that preach the Word of God. Preach the Word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Could I say this before I say too much more, that it's through the preaching of the Word of God that things begin to happen for the glory of God. Could I say this tonight? Faith cometh by hearing. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I just believe we need to hear the word of God. Amen. Well, I can tune it in on, uh, I'll get it on, uh, on this automation media system. I'll, I'll get it that way and it'll be as good as being there. No, nothing is as good as being there. Amen. We can talk about all the great campaigns all down through the world, but you'll never know this side of heaven what really went on when the Holy Ghost came down through the preaching of the Word of God. I find that it's hard to tape. It's hard to get the Holy Spirit on cassette tape or CD or any other kind of media. Now, he can work any place he wants to, uh, but brother, it's hard to tape him, but there's nothing like just being there. When the Word of God is preached. I don't care how unknown the speaker is. I don't care how ineloquent he may be or how eloquent he may be. It's not about how great a man we can find to, to come. It's about the Word of God and a burden and a fire that burns down in his bone that will cause him to preach, that will set our souls afire, uh, that we might hear the Word of God and things begin to happen because we hear, simply hear the Word of God. Now watch. We have, we have to have the Word of God to have faith. We need our faith strong that we might serve. When God wanted to move in the Old Testament, you know what he did? He gave his word. Every time, without exception, when God wanted to move, he spoke his word. His word was proclaimed. Now, listen, we live in the last days in the church age, and God is not audibly speaking to us down from heaven. The sky is not going to split open until the trumpet sounds, and I'm listening for the shout as we speak tonight. But, brother, now God has chosen the foolishness of preaching to save those that would believe. He's chosen the spoken and the preached word of God uh, that it might, uh, it might do something in the hearts and lives of the men and women that hear the word of God. Could I say this tonight? We want to have faith ministered to us through the preaching of the word of God. You say, well, you think something supernatural has happened when the preaching's going on. I do, I do. No other time have I heard uh, anyone speak than a preacher speak. And people will get glad. People will get mad. Some will get up and walk out. Some will be disturbed. Some will get right. Some will get saved. But brother, preaching has a way of doing something 
to our soul. So in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1, and the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. You're familiar with the story. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. Say, so, well, what was going on? It was a day kind of like we live in today. You know, you just can't go any place and hear the word of God. Oh, they have programs and they have speakers. They have comedians. They have all lectures. Oh, they have uh, literists, people that are very literate and they can... But man, sometimes it's pretty slim pickings when you're looking for some preaching. If you don't believe that, just tune the radio in and try to find somebody preaching. Turn the TV on and try to find somebody preaching that's shooting square and across the plate and he's not begging for your money and he doesn't need this and he doesn't want that. He's just, he's like Nathan of old, the prophet of God that comes, comes down with that bony finger and says, thou art the man. Where is that kind of Bob Jones preaching? Where is that Oliver B. Green preaching? Where is that Lester Roloff preaching? Where are the men of God that our soul burns and yearns to hear the challenge from the fire, from the pulpit. We need revival. Now, David said in Psalms 138, verse 2, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness, for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Folks, tonight, hear what this old preacher's saying. We need the word of God. When the man of God comes, we need to lend an ear to the word of God because it's the word of God that will lead us in some direction that only the Holy Ghost of God knows. Yes, we need the word of God. Could I say this? We want to be able to mind the Holy Spirit of God. Isn't it good to behave? Amen. I mean, remember when you were growing up and you didn't take you long at all as a child to figure out, if I just behave, I won't get them lickings I've been getting. <laughs> and uh, same with the Lord. If you just behave, <laughs> say, what are you saying? We want to be able to mind the Holy Ghost of God, the Holy Spirit of God. If he works through the preaching of the Word of God, then he wants to work with you and I. He wants to minister to us. And he, could I say this? He wants us to behave. He wants us to mind our actions to be pleasing to God. Uh, Paul told the Colossian people in verse 10 of chapter 1 that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Brother, that's what we need. That's what we want. Um, our hearts yearn. Our souls are starving. We need to hear from the man of God. And if there's a, a meeting coming and Brother Skipper's coming, and then we ought, to, we ought to make it a point to, if we're a preacher, if we're an evangelist, if we're a teacher, if we're a deacon, whoever we are, whatever we are, if we're just the, the commode cleaner, we need to be here and hear the Word of God. I've heard it all before. There's nothing new under the sun. Yeah, I know. But isn't it funny when somebody opens that book? It's unfounded what you might find out. It's unfounded what the Holy Spirit might tell you about yourself. It's unfounded. He might say, hey, I've got a work for you to do over here. Could you go over here and minister? We want to be able to mind the Holy Ghost of God. Pleasing actions caused by the Word of God. Our minds in line with the mind of the Holy Ghost of God. Paul told this in Romans 8, 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. I realize there will be some folks that can't come. I realize that some of us are getting old and my wife couldn't come tonight. She's, she's hurting. But she wants to be here. 
I realize that you may have a job that keeps you busy when the meeting's schedule. I got that, and I'm good with that. You may have something, but brother, if you're just laying out just to be laying out, we need the Word of God. We need revive. So when Paul says many things, he says in Philippians 3, 15 through 19, I won't take the time because I have too many points to spend too much time, but I want you to get the thought and the burden of the message more than anything else. Could I say this? We shall, or we should, through the preaching of the Word of God, through these meetings. Do you ever go to a revival meeting and you think, man, I went to that meeting, and that guy skinned my hide. <laughs> Boy, I've been there. <laughs> I've showed up on Sunday morning thinking, oh, Brother Tom, you know, it's a... My favorite preacher, he never preaches on any of my sins, and that'll be the day he'll skin me alive. It ain't, I still ain't got over the last skin and I got. It's been weeks ago now, brother, preaching on prayer. Man, I, my prayer life had dropped off something terrible. I hate to admit that to you. You say, what happened? God, he didn't even know, probably. I, I told him later, thanks for the message. I needed it. Of course, I ain't got no backside left, but say, what happened? Well, we should mortify the flesh. Uh, we should mortify the flesh and keep it under through the preaching of the Word of God. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I yet live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The crucified life. You say, what is that? That's living out of the world and in the Spirit. That, that's all it is. You say, and revival will help me? Yeah, it'll help you. <laughs> because if you will crucify the flesh and get into the meeting, it's on telling what that big preacher's going to say. But I know this. He'll say it from the Word of God. He'll say it with compassion. He'll say it with love. And brother, when you go away, he will have skinned you, and you won't even know you got skin till the Holy Spirit takes it up with you a little later. Huh? Say, what is that? Meeting. Revival meeting. Flesh means feelings, and feelings are normal, but not to be out of order when it comes to the spiritual. For if we live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. And sometimes you've got to say no to the flesh to show up to a special meeting. Amen. Um, just tough. I've traveled as an evangelist. Most of you know that for years. One of the hardest things for me to do was to go into that church after I had prayed and we had a, Bonnie and I had a, we fast a day before every meeting and prayed for the meeting and I would pray knowing when the meeting was and try to get ready for it. I'd prepare, oh, I did artwork, I'd do artwork, I'd prepare songs, I'd try to learn new songs to sing. So I was going into these little tiny small churches with, you know, 50 people, 30 people, 20 people, 6 people. But brother, when I went, I went as well prepared as I could. And when I got there, I didn't care about the offering. I didn't care what it cost me to get there. I didn't care what it was going to cost me to get home. All I was focused on was preaching the Word of God in the best way that I could to the people of God that there might be a little reviving and get into that church. And that pastor come up to me and shake my hand and said, Brother Gabbard, we're glad you're here this year, but were you scheduled this week? And I, I thought, oh my goodness, they're not even ready for this meeting. And he throws his hands up saying, oh, well, just uh, do the best you can, preach. We, we thought you were coming, you know, three or four weeks down the road, but I guess you're right, you were scheduled. So sing a couple songs tonight, draw a picture, and preach to us, you know. I mean, yeah, they weren't ready for me. They, and you know what? I don't want my church to be that way. I don't want this church to be like that. I, I, mean, I mean, when Brother Skipper comes, I want you to, you to be able to walk up to him and say, hey, we've been praying for the meeting. Hey, well, we're, we're listening. Our ear is bent to whatever you're saying tonight. Uh, our, our preachers have, have told us, uh, look, get on board. Start praying. If you have to fast to get a hold of God, then do a little fast. But listen, revival meeting is important, and we need to hear from the man of God. Could I say this tonight? We want to marvel at the miracles 
that God can and will do in our midst. Brother, when there when a spark of revival, what do you think Nehemiah was doing in that day? Brother, when they put that thing together and built that wall in 52 days, that was a miracle. When he was able to defeat Sanballat and Tobiah, in spite of all the opposition that was against them, and people saying, ah, oh, you're just, you know, you don't know what you're doing, you don't need a revival. And, but he proved them all wrong. He said, how? Through the miraculous, miracle work and power of God. Do you know that a revival meeting is a great time to invite somebody to come to church? It's a great time maybe to just talk to your neighbor or to your kids that haven't been for a long time or somebody else that maybe fall by the wayside and get them in. You say, why? Because they'll hear the preaching and they may be encouraged and God will start moving in that heart and you'll get to see uh, the, the miracle working power of God in somebody's life all because of an old-fashioned revival meeting. Yeah, we want to see the miracle working power of God. Old and New Testament full of the miracle working power of God. Each one of us here tonight, if you're saved, is a miracle. It could have happened at home. It could have happened by your bedside. It could have happened at a kitchen table. It could have happened in front of a church. Say, what is that? If you're saved tonight, you're a miracle. It's a miracle. I ever got saved. It's a miracle. Pastor said it tonight. I thank God somebody helped me get that thing figured out so that I could understand salvation is by grace through faith, plus or minus nothing. What a miracle. Could I say this tonight? We should master the things that we do for God. Do it to the best of your ability. If you sing, men sing. Sing, sing like you've never sang before. If you play an instrument, uh, play that instrument like you've never played before. If you pray, pray like you've never prayed before. If you teach, teach like you've never taught before. If you preach, preach like you've never preached before. You say, why? Because we want to be able to master the things that God wants us to do for his glory and his honor. That's what reviving's about. Being the best you can be at what God has called you to do. Mastering the things that God has called you to do. And if a man also strives for masteries, Paul told Timothy, yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully. The flippant life, there's no place for it. In the work of God. The casual social. Akuna Matata. Mentality. There's no place for it. In the church of God. I press toward the mark. For the prize. Of the high calling of God. In Christ Jesus. Sometimes we lose sight. Of what God wants us to do. Sometimes we grow weary in well-doing. We slack up on our study time as preachers. We slack up on our praying time, as I've told you I've been guilty of. We slack up on our witnessing. We don't talk to people like we used to. Uh, we should move to a closer walk with the Lord through the revival service. That's what it's about. We have a meeting to retool us, refurbish us, to encourage us, to, if you please, convict us. Because any man that's saved, any woman that's saved, if God does touch your heart cord, your, the strings of your heart, and it's a little out of tune, boy, it's just a simple fix for the Holy Ghost. All you got to say is, God, I got this. By your grace, I want to be on pitch. I want to be on time. I want to be in tune. Amen. I want perfect harmony. The preacher's talking about music tonight and how important it is. You know, if you've got a trio and they can't sing their parts, 
You've just got a joyful noise unto the Lord. I've been part of many of those. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? We should move to a closer walk with Him. He says that ye would walk worthy of God in 1 Thessalonians 2.12 who hath called you unto His kingdom and glory. And in verse, four of cha- verse 1 of chapter 4 in 1 Thessalonians, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that ye, as ye have received of us, how ye ought to walk and to please God. So ye would abound more and more. I've already given you six things and I wanted to hurry because I don't want to be so long tonight. But I wanted to speak on on our revival. And lastly, could I say the ultimate goal of what we're doing here? That we might see souls saved. As long as the Lord tarries, and the eastern sky has not split, and the trumpet has not sounded, there are souls that need to be saved. I'm not real smart, but I got that figured out. God is tearing till the last one he wants saved gets in, or the last one that can gets in. Not that there won't be souls saved in the tribulation. I got it. I, I understand that. God's always dealing with the souls of men, but we have a great responsibility as a church to tell others in our time about the Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter 3, verse 17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's our message. Uh, But these things I say that ye might be saved. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, I've just given you a few verses of Scripture, but everything that I've said tonight, I wanted it to be scriptural. I wanted it to carry a burden. The best that I can transmit that burden to you. You say, oh, Brother Phil, I... No, no, the Scripture says that we're to bear one another's burden. And I do have a burden for the church, for you which make up the church. There were five great revivals. Uh, Pastor was touching on some of those things this morning in the morning message. And he had those great statistics. And he started back with the beginning of uh, our nation as a nation being the 4th of July that we celebrate 244 years. But the church first great revival occurred when 3,000 Jews came to Christ on the day of Pentecost. You talk about a revival meeting. You know what? The guy doing the preaching was none other than Peter, the man that denied the Lord. But brother, he didn't stay backslid long. He got right. He got it all right. And brother, he stepped up and did the work. He was the best he could be at what he did. And he preached the death, burial, resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it set him apart from any other Old Testament Jew had ever said. And 3,000 were added to the church that day. Say, what was that? Brother, that was miracles unfolding. The miracle of the miraculous power of God unfolding to the church. You talk about an encouragement to the church. I just believe revival meeting, even today, ought to be an encouragement to the church. So on the day of Pentecost, somewhere around A.D. 33, that awesome beginning was a foretaste of what would happen time after time throughout all history, and it has done that very thing. By the year 300, approximately 14 million called themselves Christians. And by the year 500, boy, I'm going back, the number neared 40 million. Say, what happened? Revival broke out. Since the early 1700s, at at the the beginning of our, our nation, God has brought about 
a number of notable revivals. The first being that we call it the Great Awakening. And I don't know if Pastor realized, but he mentioned some of these guys this morning. As this thing kind of got a hold of my soul today. In the New World, that's America, known as the Great Awakening, spread through the American colonies between 1725 and 1760 under the preachers like Gilbert Tennant and Jonathan Edwards and the famous message that he preached, sinners in the hands of an angry God, and he wasn't even a good speaker. He read his messages. But the power of God came through the preaching of the Word of God. Jonathan Edwards, that English evangelist, George Whitfield, the revivals reached their peak from 1740 to 1742. At the same time as the Great Awakening in America was the Wesleyan Revival in England. And at the time of John Wesley's death in 1791, uh, Methodism numbered 79,000 plus in England and 40,000 plus in America. You say, what happened? God is able to revive. His people. Then they call it the second great awakening. As I close with these these vivid illustrations, the second awakening, the great awakening, America's next revival began in about 1801, 1800, at the Cane Ridge Camp Meeting in Kentucky, as the historians write, where as many as 3,000 were converted in that one camp meeting. The banner year for camp meeting was about 1811 when approximately one-third of all Americans had attended one of those camp meetings. By 1806, the awakening had reached Williams College in Massachusetts. It, Massachusetts, I can't even say that. They started down in Georgia and that thing swept right up through the eastern colonies. These there were five students. Here's the story that's told that happened. There were five students prayed during a thunderstorm in the shelter of a haystack. They just crawled in. Four of the five committing themselves through this prayer meeting and these, this camp meeting to becoming missionaries. The Haystack Prayer Meeting, as it came to be called, was the beginning of the American Foreign Missions Movement in America because from that time has sent more missionaries, more Bible, more monies than any other nation on the face of the earth. You're right. God bless America. We need reviving. Prayer Meeting Revival. Beginning as a prayer meeting, they called it the prayer meeting revival. Begin as a prayer meeting of six people on Fulton Street in New York City in 1857. The prayer meeting revival spread quickly throughout the world. Over the next two years, a million converts were added to America, churches, and a million to churches in England and Ireland. You say, what was that about? It was about the Word of God being preached, plus or minus nothing, people just getting saved. And it all started because five or six people started praying. You think there's hope for a church like ours? I, I do. I have never lost sight of that hope. I have never lost sight of that vision that God is able to take a church and stir that church to a point where it can be everything He wants it to be. Then that great Welch Revival, I'll close with this. The Welch Revival began in 1904 under the preaching of Evan Roberts. Within two years, 100,000 converts were added to the Welch Church. More than 5 million came to Christ as the revival spread throughout the world. And could I say about this time, the cults began to muster and form also because the devil is one slew shrewd operator so when you start praying for our meeting expect a little opposition when you set your calendar and you say i'm going to be there every night if it hair lips the devil expect a little opposition 
I mean, when you say, look, I haven't made all the meetings down through the years, but it seems like uh, the preachers, are, they're, they're getting on board and they're pulling together and they're praying and they, they want God to do something. They're asking God. They're saying, God, you said you were able to revive us. The answer to all those questions was yes, 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 yes. And I still believe it tonight that God is able to revive us. You say, are we dead? No, we're not. We're, we're making it. But I think we could be better. For the glory of God. Then the modern day revivals, perhaps the most remarkable revival that has taken place in China since the last missionaries left. They run them all out in 1953. You realize I was three years old when that happened. But China saw a great movement. And I could speak of others, the Korean revival and different revivals that America helped start and helped spark because of people just like you. Say, what happened? They got a burden. There was something that, that was going on. There was a wall that needed to be built back in Jerusalem, but they were over here. But listen, they prayed, and they sent their resources, and they sent their money, and they sent their children, and they trained their kids, and they sent them out. And literally thousands of people were saved. In 1980, there were 2 million Christian believers in China. And by the year 2000, there were approximately 75 million. Well, I just never cared much for them China people. You better love those China people because there are going to be a bunch of them in heaven when you get there. Amen. <laughs> See, what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying, look, get a burden for our meeting. Get it on your mind and get it on your heart. Learn the names of Brother Skipper and Brother Skipper's wife, and I don't know her name right now. It's just slipped my mind that somebody may know. And begin to pray for them. I've been there. I, I've tried to do this. It's hard coming in when the church hadn't even prayed for the meeting, when the church hadn't even thought about how they're going to help the, the preacher prepare and, and speak each night. So, well, it's just three nights. It'll be coming and going. It's okay. And back to business as usual. That's the last thing you want yeah. business as usual boy Nehemiah didn't think it, of it that way David didn't think of it that way Samuel didn't think of it that way and the lamp of God had gone out but all through the word of God they were revived say so what are you saying I, not much tonight I'm just giving you some thoughts on revival and uh I want you to know, I'm praying, I'm challenging you, too, to pray for this meeting like you've never prayed for any other meeting. Yeah? And if you've got to make some changes to your schedule, make them. Because challenges are what we get day by day living in this old world. But I'd like to be challenged by the Lord to step up. And I'd like to change. If I need to change, I want to change. Tonight you may start, Pastor, give a good uh, reference to salvation as we started the meeting. And I'm looking over the congregation tonight. and I'm not going to ever say there's no one here that's not saved because I don't know. And I look around and, you know, probably a good chance everybody's saved, but I'm not sure. Only you're sure. And God knows. So if there's a need tonight, as our, uh, maybe Jeremiah helped me out a little bit. Pastor's going to come and we'll close out with a song. And maybe you just need to give your heart to Christ tonight. Uh, refocus how you think about church and revival meetings. Accept the challenge to pray, trust God for the miracles that he wants to do, whatever those may be. What can we